your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Timothy as we continue a series on leadership this morning. And we look at chapter number 3, verses number 8 through 13. I think it's an interesting thing. and I, There's a few preachers that I follow. A few preachers that I follow. Uh, I enjoy listening to them. I enjoy reading from their, from their work. And as I uh, prepare for messages, I normally uh, go over to their website and I find a particular passage that I'm going to be speaking on. And I either listen to their message or I read their messages that they've done on that particular passage. And it's amazing how chicken people are when it comes to controversial issues. Uh, this is one of those passages that uh, you're, if you do verse by verse messages, all of a sudden you get to verse number maybe uh, 9 or 10 and you skip. And you don't talk about that, and you just move on, and, and you say you talk verse by verse, but you really don't. And this morning, I want to talk about leadership, and I want to talk about church leadership, and I want to talk about following those who have been called of God to serve Him. When God looks for somebody to serve Him, when God looks for somebody that will be a leader, when God looks for somebody in whom He can call into His service, you know what He doesn't look for? He doesn't look for talent or ability. When God looks for people that will serve Him, that he can, that he can use for His honor and glory, He's not concerned about talent or ability, but He is concerned about a heart that is yielded to Him. Now, if I said the term deacon, immediately certain concepts or connotations come to your mind. If I said uh, Uncle Joe served as a deacon down at the church, you'd have either a positive or negative feeling toward Uncle Joe just because of what I just said. He served as a deacon. And immediately you come to in your mind of some misconceptions or some uh, extra biblical ideas of deacons. Paul has been talking about what's involved with starting a New Testament church to young Timothy. Timothy was left there in Ephesus to start a church, to build a church, to get people to serve him, to get people to come to know God. And in order to do that, there had to be certain leaders that were, that were placed in particular places within the church. And he talked about the area of an elder or an overseer or a bishop or a pastor. All of those terms are used in chapter number 3, the beginning of that, of what the qualifications would be for someone who is a pastor, an elder of the church. The misconception there is that there is one pastor for each church. That never was the case in the New Testament. There was a multiplicity of elders. There was a multiplicity of leaders. There was a multiplicity of, of pastors within a single church. There wasn't just one pastor. There was a multitude of pastors. There were a multitude of elders. There were obviously different men who had different talents or different abilities or different strengths or weaknesses, but they all served as the ruling body of the church, and they were called elders, bishops, overseers. The next group of people that they got involved here were, were the deacons. And the deacons, as a matter of fact, it's interesting that in the whole book of Acts, the word deacons never used anywhere. This other word called servant or to serve is used over a hundred times in the New Testament. And the, the meaning here is a, is a group of people who are performing a task. That's it. A group of people who are performing a task. And the term that you use for that group of people who are performing that task is deacon. Now, there is not a male term for deacon and female term for deacon. Matter of fact, there is no term for deacon. The very word deacon is not used. It's more of a servant. And so we've come to think of a deacon as being someone who rules. But a deacon is someone who serves. And this morning, I want to talk about servant leadership. I want, to, I want to have a person who's over me, who understands my heartfelt desires. I want to have a guy who's over me and whom I respect, who understands what the big picture is, knows where he's going and how we're going to get there and what it's going to cost, and someone who serves in leadership. I don't want a ruler. In a few months, we're going to be voting in America on a president and on someone who we send to Washington to represent us in the House of Representatives. And we're going, to, we're going to vote on those. We're going to get some guys together and say, this would be the best person that we could possibly send. I don't want to send a ruler. It's amazing that when you get somebody that's in your neighborhood to serve on the city council, all of a sudden, they're not my servant any longer. They're my ruler. We're not voting on rulers. We're voting on servants. 
people who can go to serve us, to represent us, to be our person standing, representing what we believe and what we want. The root idea of service here dealt with serving food. And it's amazing that when you look at the church and New Testament church, it grew and grew and grew and grew, and there became a, a little depression in the community. Their people lost their jobs, and they had needs, and the people came together, took up collections so that they could give out those that had need. And those individuals who were responsible to giving out that which was needed were servants. And later on, Paul says, well, we're going to call them deacons. And the idea here started with food. Matter of fact, the very first place that you find this concept of serving and this idea of a servant is found in John chapter number 2. Most of you don't think of it as this, but they were, they were invited to a wedding, Jesus and his disciples. And while they were there at the wedding, they ran out of wine. The individuals that were serving the wine were deacons, servants that served the food at the tables. You know, when we come to this idea of the New Testament church, we're all servants. Every single one of us are called to serve others. Matter of fact, when Paul lists the gifts of the Spirit, one of those gifts is the gift of serving. The idea of ministering to someone else. And in, in Ephesians chapter number 4, when we lay out what leaders are to do, they are to equip others to serve. When we're talking about leadership here, we're actually talking about servants. When we're not talking about someone lording over us. Now, if I said, poor Uncle Joe, he served as a deacon down at the church. One of the concepts that will go in your mind is that Uncle Joe ran the church. That Uncle Joe was in charge of the church, and he ran the business of the church. But the concept of a deacon isn't a ruler, but rather a servant. That brings me to something. I, let's, I want to read this passage, and then I want to talk about some other misconceptions of this concept of a deacon. 1 Timothy chapter number 3, we're going to start in verse number 8. Deacons, servants, likewise, are to be men worthy of respect. They're to be sincere. They're not to be individuals that indulge in much wine. They're not to pursue dishonest gain. They must... Keep hold of the deep truths of the faith. They've got to have clear consciences. They must first be tested. And then, if there's nothing against them, let them serve as servants. Let them serve as this person who serves as a deacon. In the same way, their wives are to be women worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but being temperate, trustworthy, and everything. A deacon must be the husband of but one wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and a great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. This calling to serve. The person who serves is a deacon. Father, as we open this passage of Scripture, I pray, Father, that you'll help us overcome all of our misconceptions, all of those ideas that we've stuck into our head that we don't know really how they got there, Lord. We just heard somebody say, and we grabbed onto it, and we believed it, and yet we never checked it out. We never looked at your word. This morning, Father, as we look at your word, I pray that we would see as you see, hear as you hear, and understand as your spirit leads. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. I think there's a lot of misconceptions. I've dealt with one of them right off, is that this idea of a deacon is someone who rules, but rather a deacon is somebody who serves. And one of the misconceptions here is that the first mention of deacons is found in Acts chapter number 6. And I read that as our scripture reading for the morning. Acts chapter 6 doesn't call these men deacons. In verse number 4, it talks about servants and those serving tables, and it was referring to the apostles. Not the seven men that were going to be serving the tables. The other concept here was that these men are, are uh, uh, used in the serving of the word. The idea that these guys had to be uh, knowledgeable in the, in the word of God. That doesn't say that anywhere. Matter of fact, I think it's really interesting. If you really look at the requirements in Acts chapter number 6 of those who were going to serve, they didn't look for people who had the gift of administration. 
They, they didn't look at those who had business experience. They didn't look for an accountant. They didn't look for someone who had gone to school to be an, a, a restaurant manager. They didn't look for all those things. I, I thought it was real interesting that when they said, these are the, the requirements of a deacon, they were, number one was to be filled with the Spirit, and number two was to have wisdom. Now, I thought I was blown away when I said, if I had to pick someone that's going to serve the church, I want them, number one, to be filled with the Spirit. Number two, I want them to have wisdom. What's wisdom? The application of knowledge. I know people that are so filled up with knowledge that they're no good to anybody. There's other people, they don't seem to have much book learning, but they've got a lot of what we call what? Common sense. You know, that idea of wisdom here is the application of what I know. The ability to determine this is the way that we should go and maybe not be able to analyze it and say that's the reason why this is the way we should go. It just makes sense. When Paul's writing Timothy, do you realize that it's 30 years after Pentecost? That there are churches now all over the place. The, 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 de the depression that took place in the Roman government had people lost their jobs and then as the religious persecution took place and these people came to Christianity, were thrown out of the temple, lost their jobs. You know, the, the people became needy. And, and from that persecution and from that depression, they ended up spreading the gospel. They actually left Jerusalem and went out into the, the Roman Empire. And they, as they went, they talked about who Jesus was and the one and only true God. And the one and only way to God was through Jesus Christ. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And they, they brought that concept with them, and they started meeting together. You know why they met together? The Lord said, don't forsake the meeting on the Lord's day. And they came together on the first day of the week to celebrate the risen Lord. And you know what they did? They took whatever scripture they had, and they read it openly and publicly. That's the reason why when we come together on Sunday morning, I take the Word of God, and I open it up, and I read it publicly. And Timothy was starting this church there in Ephesus, and 30 years after Pentecost, we're starting to get now some instruction of what's involved with laying out a New Testament church. You know how most churches get started today? Most churches get started because Sister Jane didn't like Mary Sue. And Mary Sue and Sister Jane kind of had a little squabble, and it drew three or four other people together. And you said, know what? We can't go over there because Sister Jane is just a pain to be with. And so why don't we start meeting in our living room or down here at the coffee shop and we'll read the Word of God down there together and pretty soon we've got another group of believers meeting. And that's the way churches get started today. Very few churches are started under what we would call uh, biblical principles. There are a couple here in Enid that were started under biblical principles. Uh, West Willow, for example, was started as a mission to Frisco edition. They had this new edition in Enid. It was called the Frisco edition. And so West Willow was started as a mission church to that edition. There was a couple other churches in town. Uh, Oakwood Christian was started by Davis Park, saying that we want to have a church over on the west side of Enid. And so we're going to commission a group of people. They're going to go over, and they're going to build this church, and they're going to reach God's people in that area of town. They're going to reach new people for God. We're going to build a church, and it was called Oakwood Christian. Garland Road Baptist Church was started by First Baptist Church downtown deliberately because they needed a church on the west side. There was a group of people saying, we need to start a Baptist church over on that west side. Those ungodly sinners over there on that west side of town who don't know God, need to know God, and we need to put a church over there. And they started Garland Road Baptist Church. The church actually gave them 10 acres of property, gave them $100,000, and paid the pastor's salary for the first couple years. That's called the right way to start a church. The wrong way to start a church is, I tell you what, you group over here, you get mad at that group over there. See, there's more of them over there than over here. So you people are going to get mad at that group over there, and you're not going to come no more. You're going to meet together and have your own church. You're going to be called the right-sided church because all those people on the left side are obviously doomed for the pits, and you're the right side, so you're going to call yourself the right side church of the living God. That's the way most churches get started. 30 years after Pentecost, Paul sits down by the inspiration of the Scripture and lists some of the qualifications of a leader. And he says, if you're going to have an overseer, this is kind of who you should look for. If you're going to have someone who serves, this is the task that, that, that we want them to kind of be able to do. Matter of fact, I've got to say this. There is absolutely no assigned task to the deacon. 
The only assigned task to the pastor, the elder, the bishop, the overseer, was the administering of the Word of God in prayer. It didn't say the guy has to do hospital visits or go call on the sick or do any. It says he's got to minister the Word of God and pray. Misconceptions this morning of what the leaders are supposed to do. Paul lists those qualities in the male deacon, and I'm going to say the female deacon here in a minute, of who they were supposed to be. What kind of conditions are in their heart? I've got to tell you another misconception. I deal with this one. Matter of fact, I think a couple weeks ago, Jay and I talked about this before all you people got here and interrupted us. But we talked about the idea that deacons are not many elders. Deacons are not elders in waiting. Deacons are not elders in training. If you look at the qualifications here of a deacon and an elder, they're absolutely the same. The only real difference dealt with the ability to teach was the only big difference between the qualifications of an elder and the qualifications of a deacon. The person holding the office of deacon, and if you want to make up a word of what a, because the, the term deacon is not masculine or feminine, it's gender neutral. If you want to make up a term that is masculine and, and feminine, then you say deacon is the masculine and deaconess is the feminine of the same word servant. And if you want to find out what they have to have, the very first thing they have to have is to be filled with the Spirit of God and wisdom. The elder, the pastor, the overseer, the bishop, the deacon, the deaconess, they're not super saints. Uh, somewhere along the way, we said, well, you know, they're farther along than we are. They've been saved longer than we have. They're the gray hairs. They're the no hairs. They're the ones that are filled with wisdom, and we're going to follow them. Let me tell you something. I've met some old people that are silly. I've met some old people that have no business at all leading anything. And so age here has nothing to do with serving. I remember going to a church, and they called on the junior deacon. He must be a deacon. He's almost a deacon. He's not quite a deacon. He's a new deacon. He's a young deacon. He's a little deacon. You know, and he's called the junior deacon. You know, I remember going to a church one time and they called it the deacon at large. Now he must have been the big deacon, the heavy deacon, the fat deacon, the old deacon. You know, and so you come up with all of these crazy misconceptions that aren't listed anywhere in the word and we run with it. And you know what? There's a denomination, I don't want to say their name, but they have had a fallen out amongst themselves over this concept that the word deacon is masculine and that only men can serve. Now it's an amazing thing that when they want to have a dinner at the church that none of these guys cook a thing. None of these guys set a table. None of these guys do anything with the chairs. None of these guys, you know, make sure the windows are washed, make sure the silverware is all in place. None of these guys do a blasted thing. But we can't have women who are servants. And they've split the entire denomination over this concept of feminine and masculine servants. I believe that every believer is supposed to be a servant. And that way, every believer, male or female, are in that sense a deacon, or if I invent a term, a deaconess to the church. Now I want to talk real quickly. What are the qualifications of this guy, deacon? I'm going to use that masculine term, deacon. And what are the qualifications of the, the deacon? Well, the first one is a personal qualification. The, the deacon has to be a man of, of dignity. Seriousness, it means. Stateliness. Uh, a deacon must not be silly, flippant person who makes light of serious matters. Uh, now, I'm not saying he has to be a cold-hearted, uh, joyless person. But I'm telling you that he has to understand that as the preacher said in the Old Testament, there's a time to laugh and there's a time to cry. There's a time to tear and there's a time to mend. And the deacon has the wisdom of knowing those things. He's not double-tongued. He's not a person who speaks one thing to one group and another thing to another person. He can't be a politician then. See, a politician gets up in front of the National Dog Association and becomes a dog lover. And the afternoon gets up from the National Cat Association, and he's a cat lover. And the next day he's in front of the National Horse Association, and he's a horse lover. 
That's a double-tongued person. It means he has no foundation at all. He's a chameleon. Whoever he's around is who he is. That's a double-tongued person. It says that he can't be addicted to much wine. Addicted here means one who allows his mind to be turned from or occupied with. It says that the deacon can't be someone who is interested or fond of sordid gain. That he's always looking at the offering. He's always looking at a way to invest the offering. He's always looking at a way, a scheme, that if we do this, we can get this other thing. The personal life of the deacon. Uh, there's a spiritual life too. You know, it, it talks about the faith. He has to be, wouldn't it make sense, if he's going to be involved in a church, a group of people who are called out of God, who are baptized believers, to meet together, to hear the word of God, you know, read before them, pray, that this guy would be a believer? Wouldn't that make sense? Or a spiritual life, you want someone who's a believer. You want someone who understands what we call the faith, the, the doctrines of the Bible, the teachings of the Bible. He's going to do this with a clear conscience. He doesn't have a whole lot of things that accuse him in his life. His Christian service. You know, the deacon is to be observed. He's a guy who likes to serve others. This is a person who, wouldn't it be nice if he had the gift of service? that you would observe this guy, and he's got this gift of service. He loves to, he's not happy unless he's serving others. Yeah, that would be the qualification that you'd want as a deacon. And you're supposed to test him. Now, I don't think there's a formal test that you sit down and say, here, I want you to answer these 50 questions, and we're going to see how you do, and you've got to score 70 or better to become a deacon. I know of churches that do that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you observe this person. You want to make sure this person isn't a novice. He's not somebody who's going to be elevated, puffed up in his head about, oh boy, I get to serve tables. I'm somebody special. I, I'm in charge of the forks today. You know, and he, and he ends up, you know, guarding all the forks and he makes sure he counts all the forks and counts all the forks back. And I mean, he makes sure that you clean your fork. I mean, can you imagine? Isn't that silly? There's a moral side to this. I call it moral purity. The deacon is nothing less than the elder. And by the way, these qualities aren't just for the leadership. They're for all of us. We expect these things of everyone. But I certainly want them to be the quality that I put in someone that I'm following. The deacon isn't any less than the elder when it comes to being beyond reproach. What does that mean? You're not going to be able to arraign him. We're not going to be able to find charge against him. The King James used the word unblameable, without blame. Didn't mean sinless. Which one of us are sinless? None of us are. So you, there, all of us are going to have some blame, but the concept here was that there's not something in his life that's going to distract the body from serving God. The spiritual requirements are the same for the elder, for the deacon, matter of fact, for anyone that calls upon the name of the Lord. The home life, the deacon, like the elder, has to have a spiritual character here in the home. He's got to be good managers of the home. They're not a requirement that they have children. I know of a church that said, you want to be a deacon? Well, first got to get married. So the guy goes out and gets married. And I want to be a deacon. And, well, you can't be a deacon. You don't have any kids. And so they wait. They, they have children. And he says, I want to be a deacon. He says, well, your children aren't old enough to determine whether or not they're going to follow in the Lord. You know, so you got to wait until your kids are old. And that's not what this is dealing with. You see how narrow... We can become. The qualifications here of an elder are the same as the qualifications of a deacon. And that's the reason why I say deacons aren't many elders. They're not elders in training. You see, they're the same. Because these are the same characteristics that every single one of us are attempting to acquire. Now, I want to use verse number 11. Verse number 11, you're reading along in the guy that's a great Bible scholar. He's written hundreds of books. He claims to follow verse by verse of his teaching. You go to his website, you look at 1 Timothy, you find chapter number 3, you get to this point, and it's not there. I call that a sissy. Either that or he's smarter than I am. He didn't publish it, what he believes. In verse number 11, Paul is not speaking to the deacon's wives. Matter of fact, that's the position that some people take. That now, we're well, the deacon. If you're going to be an elder, you need to be married, but we're not going to examine your wife. You're going to be an elder. But if you're going to be a deacon, okay, we're going to, you got to be married, and we're also going to examine the qualifications of your wife. You see what I'm saying? There's an inconsistency here. 
if you read and study carefully, you're going to find that there is another break that takes place in this particular passage. If I back up here for a minute, some people believe that now we're talking about the deacon's wives and other people think that we're talking about a separate office. And I'm going to make a claim here this morning that I think he's talking about a separate office. Now typically and historically, this is what Baptists believe. Baptists believe that now we're talking about the deacon's wives. And this is going to make me different from my Baptist friends. I'll tell you a little story and then I'm going to move on. When it came time to finishing up school, I lacked three hours in some Bible class. And I wanted to graduate on a certain time. And there was a doctor of theology at the school that offered a tutoring class. You could pay your semester fee, you could pay your matriculation fee, and you also paid a tutoring fee, and you got credit if you took this guy's tutoring class. And I took a class from him called Pastoral Epistles, meaning 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. 1 and 2 Thessalonians are called pastoral epistles. And I remember when we got to verse number 11. He says, do you want me to tell you what the Bible says, or do you want me to tell you what Baptists say? Now here's where we've got to ask ourselves. Do you want me to tell you what Baptist tradition is? That's the way I was brought up. That's the training that I have. Or do you want tell you what the Bible says. Now there's a big difference here because the Baptists say that this is now talking about the deacon's wife and I don't see that here. If you look strictly at the text and not tradition, Paul recognizes that there is a role for women who are servants within the church. The administration of the church, the structure of the church would include women. And I think that there's a strong case for the deaconess, and I make up that term, it's a feminine gender of a servant. And it goes like something like this. First of all, the case would say that as you follow through the text, that each time that Paul talks about a separate office, he starts with a little term. He says, likewise. Verse number 9 of chapter number 2. Verse number 8 of chapter number 3. In Titus chapter 2 and verse number 3 and 6. There's a transition between the offices, and he says, likewise. And what he's doing is making a distinction here between two people, two kinds of people. Secondly, there's no possessive pronoun or definitive article connecting the women as deacons. Now, that's a structural thing. You're sitting here saying, I'm examining the scripture. I want to know what the scripture says. I'm sitting here telling you there's no masculine or feminine when you're talking about a servant. And they make up the term deacon. Meaning men, deaconesses for women. Paul gives no qualifications for the elder's wife. I've said that. The elder, he has to be married, but his wife doesn't have to be a believer. She doesn't have to ever come to church. She doesn't have to be godly. She doesn't have to do anything. She can be a gossip. She can be a drunkard. She, he's an elder. It doesn't matter what his wife is. You say, no way. I'm not going to have that guy lead me and his wife's a drunkard. I'm not going to have that guy lead me and his wife's not even a believer. But you said that about the deacon. Can't be a deacon unless his wife is a certain thing. You follow me? Fourthly, Paul did not use the word deaconess. I said there's no such word in the Greek language. The term deacon is gender neutral. Finally, there are qualifications parallel to the male deacon. What's the qualifications of the deaconess? She's got to be dignified. She can't be a malicious gossip. She, she has to be temperate. She's not to be a drinker. She can't, she's got to be sober in her judgment. She's got to be faithful. You follow what I'm saying? The qualifications of a deacon is the same as a deaconess, which is the same thing as an elder. Would a rose be a rose if you called it a tulip? Would a rose be a rose if you called it a tulip? Well, you say, well, of course it'd be a rose. It wouldn't matter what you called it. It is what it is, right? Well, we've had deaconesses here for some time. They're just not called deaconesses. You know why? Because the leadership's been chicken. Because the leadership here has been cowardly about just identifying who they are. We've sidestepped the issue. And so if we want to have an activity here, and we need a group of women who are servants, you know what we do? We call on Carol. We have an office here called Carol. And you know what Carol does? She gets on the telephone and she calls her co-chair Barbara. 
And we have an office here called the Barber and Carroll office. It's true. And then as the girls got older, they joined the group. And it's a private club. You got to be invited and born into it to get to be part of the servants group. Are they deaconesses? Yeah. That's what they are. Whether you call them that or not, that's what they are. And I would imagine the very first official person that ever became a deaconess here without the, the terminology was the predecessor to Lynn. The treasurer, some servant that knew how to balance the checkbook, who happened to be a woman, her name was Pat, and they allowed her to come into the deacons' meetings to give a report, but then she had to leave. You remember that, Gary? And finally we said, you know what? That's kind of silly. You know, she pays the bills. She knows more about what's coming and going here than anything. And when Lynn became the treasurer, see, you can have a woman treasurer, but you couldn't have a deaconess. Because there's no such thing as a deaconess, but we've got a treasurer. Find that one in the book. And Lynn became our first official deaconess. And now the only thing we've got to do is get her up here in front of her, whack her upside the head and pray over her. I've made a distinction here this morning with the idea of service. I missed one of the misconceptions. I thought it was funny. I remember Bill telling me this one time. We had it in our Constitution that we had to have seven deacons. Do you remember this? And we started looking around. We couldn't find seven guys. And we started, well, you know, got to have seven. To, well, what are you going on? The Bible or are you going the Constitution? We changed the Constitution. They say we need deacons that are servants. And it doesn't matter how many there are. And right now we have two of them. We have Doug and Dwayne. There are a couple other guys that we've tried to get to be deacons. We've twisted their arm. We've coerced them. We found dirt on them and said we're going to publish it in the paper if they don't serve. But they hold fast. They say, no, we're not going to do this. Don't want to do that. And we can't get them to do it. There is a great reward to serving God. There really is. I mean, I, I've got a little thing somebody gave us. It said, you know, the, the preacher doesn't get paid much, but the, the uh, fringe benefits are out of this world. And there are. The, the benefits of serving God and being a leader in God's church is just out of this world, the benefits, the rewards. One, a person who serves in a church has a high standing. We, we, we elevate them, probably more than what we ought to. But there's a high standing, referring here, here to an elevated position, someone on the platform, someone on a pedestal. That's why we have to be careful not to do that to someone who's immature or new, because we don't want to have this pride thing going. But we do. We've got guys that are faithfully serving God here in this place. And, and you know, we, we, we honor them. There, there's a great confidence that is built in serving Christ. There's a great confidence that is in a person's life who serves Christ. One talks about this clear conscience. You can't get up here and talk about the Word without first examining your heart. And there is this, this idea here of a leader in God's church being confident in their faith, built up in the faith. I learned a lot more than I ever can give out by studying the Word, getting ready for one of these messages. It makes me confident in my faith. I might not be able to persuade, and we might never have an office here officially called deaconess. But I'm convinced that when Paul told Timothy, this is how we're to start this church here in Ephesus, that that's what he was telling him. And there's an obligation to all of us that when God calls someone to serve, and we recognize it, and we put them into that office, that we do honor them, and we do respect them, and we do follow them.
And this morning, as we talk about the structure of our church, I want guys that are filled with the Spirit of God and women that are wise unto the Lord. And we're going to recognize that and we're going to follow them with our whole heart. Let's pray.